Let's move on to the next question now. This concerns sciatic nerve palsy. And the question reads, what percentage of patients with complete perineal palsy after total hip arthroplasty will never recover full strength? So note that this is sort of a double negative question. And the answer to this question is answer number two. That is 60 to 65 percent of people will not recover full strength if they've sustained a sciatic, uh, excuse me, a perineal branch of sciatic nerve palsy after total hip arthroplasty, which means that the likelihood of complete recovery is only 35 or 40 percent. The rest of the answers are incorrect just because they're not the right number. A few comments about sciatic nerve palsy. It's relatively uncommon, fortunately. It's a very uh, severe injury for the patient uh, that uh, sustains it. It's most commonly of the perineal division of the sciatic nerve, and it's thought that, that the reason for that is because the perineal branch travels most closely to the area of the acetabulum that's being instrumented. Uh, most of these injuries occur at the level of the, para, uh, excuse me, of the sciatic nerve passing by the acetabulum. They can occur due to retraction if it's a direct injury. They can also occur for other reasons which we'll talk about in a second. Other causes of sciatic nerve injury, direct trauma as I mentioned due to retraction or other uh, sharp objects such as a screw. Stretch injury is relatively common also when the uh, amount that the nerve can stretch without sustaining trauma is exceeded. It's also possible to have injury due to compression early on after surgery due to a hematoma or some other factor. It's important to know which patients are at risk for nerve palsy. These include patients with hip dysplasia, patients undergoing revision surgery, women are at a little higher risk, patients undergoing substantial limb lengthening are at greater risk because of the stretch injuries that we've talked about, patients with post-traumatic arthritis that are at higher risk, and patients undergoing a procedure that the surgeon considers difficult are also at higher risk. We've already talked about the prognosis uh, not being particularly good for these patients. Most patients present with numbness, paresthesias, or weakness, but it's important to know that later on one of the most important symptoms can be recurring and ongoing pain, which is one of the patients, frequently one of the patient's greatest complaints. If the problem occurs early on, it's important to examine the patient to make sure there's no evidence of a a major expans expansile hematoma because that's a potentially treatable problem. And if there's a question about whether a hematoma is present, a CT scan or ultrasound can be done to try to identify that. And if it's present, of course, evacuation would be appropriate. Let's move on to another question regarding sciatic nerve palsy. This uh, relates to a patient who undergoes total hip arthroplasty and immediately after surgery is unable to dorsiflex her ankle or extend her great toe. Four weeks later, she continues to have what they call a slapping gait, which I presume means the patient has a foot drop. And the question concerns what would be the appropriate further management. Radiographs of the patient preoperatively and postoperatively are shown. You see the patient has a high hip dislocation. So this is a patient who's at risk for a sciatic uh, injury because of the dysplasia diagnosis and because of the fact that the patient is likely to require some lengthening of the limb. The postoperative radiographs are shown. I will just draw your attention to one finding on this radiograph, which is the long central screw there, which uh, does have a bearing on the uh, potentially correct answers to this question. So the, the correct answer to this question is given as answer number three, ankle foot orthosis. And I think that is true that at four weeks after surgery, the, the great majority of patients, the correct answer would be observation and treatment with an AFO. In this particular case, because there's a long screw, you could make the argument that further imaging to make sure that screw wasn't against the sciatic nerve would be appropriate. And that would most likely be done with a CT scan, quite honestly. But answer one, MRI of the pelvis, would not really be a wrong answer, although I think number three is probably a better answer to this question. The patient would not likely benefit from revision hip arthroplasty. Posterior tibial tendon transfer would not be done early on. And you, whether or not you did get a neurology consultation would be up to the surgeon but there's not any clear major benefit in doing so. Treatment of sciatic palsy. It's important to know intraoperatively, of course, the best thing to do is to prevent it. So if you're doing a uh, high hip dislocation patient such as the one uh, described, a subtrochanteric osteotomy with shortening of the bone is often done to minimize the stretch of the sciatic nerve or using implants to allow you to avoid excessive stretch of the nerve. If the problem occurs immediately postoperatively, most patient, uh, excuse me, surgeons would place the patient in a position of hip extension and knee flexion to try to relax the sciatic nerve. And if there's any evidence of a uh, expanding hematoma or a large hematoma in the region of the nerve, 
immediate evacuation should be uh, done, and that should be considered a surgical, an urgent surgical problem. And then for the patient with a persistent problem, an AFO is the first line of management, as we've already discussed. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.